Welcome to the Entangled Hearts channel. Here, we uncover the secrets of love and relationships, explore issues of infidelity. Join us and immerse yourself in the world of emotions. I would probably have left it alone and continued my life without her, but it was his mistake that did this. He made me act on this mistake, and whether she saw it or not, their complete disregard tore me apart that IT was obvious that Samantha, with whom I had lived for six years, would not be my wife for long, part of the problem in our marriage was that I had been working too much over the past six months. I was in line for a serious promotion, which would come with a significant salary increase. This meant that Sam could quit her job, and we could start our family, another problem was that Samantha is a beautiful woman, one of those breathtaking beauties who haven't learned to be a bitch when men flirt with her. Not that she flirts back, but she has a wonderful smile that sends the wrong signal. Since Sam resembles Scarlett Johansson so much, with the same beautiful face and magnificent body, just taller, men naturally gravitate towards her, for some time, I had suspicions. She worked late too often, and she had to go out of town more frequently. But the mistake on his face at their company's holiday party was undeniable evidence. I almost had to force Sam to invite me to this party, and now I knew why respect is an important thing in my family. By the way, my name is John Simoncelli. If you'll spare me a few minutes, I'll give you just one example. In high school, I was the best player on the school team. It was at the beginning of the season, and we were facing a team with the best chances of not letting us into the championship. The opponent's pitcher threw a fast ball straight at my head. The ball missed my face but hit my helmet. I stood up and ran first. I looked at the pitcher, and he insulted me with a smirk, and then quietly said with just one mistake, chicken. I lunged at him and surprised him to no end. Instead of playing like in most baseball games, I hit him with my fist straight in the nose, breaking it and splattering his beautiful white uniform with blood, after that, hell broke loose. I was suspended pending a hearing on whether I would be disqualified forever. My coach looked at me with considerable disgust, but my old man stood by me when he drove me home. I saw what that jerk did, he said to himself. You can't let these punks disrespect you. Everything will be fine once they find out they have your balls. However, the disapproval of the coach bothered me. He had been my coach for the last three years, and I wanted him to respect me. When I showed up at his office the next day, he gave me a lecture that I would never forget, to this day. What's it to you what some punk says to you? You know where I grew up. At the corner of State and 75th, where some thug was always trying to push my buttons. I got lucky. Neither my mom nor dad would stand for any fights. It helped me stay on track to college and out of the slums. Now I live where I want. I'm doing what I love, and those dumb thugs are either dead, in jail, or shooting up in some room. So, here's the deal. If you play for me again, there will be no more fights, no matter what. In the end, I was disqualified for three games. Someone was looking out for me because Ron Muller, the opponent's catcher, showed up at the hearing. It seemed he was disgusted by how his coach was trying to win. Their coach ordered the pitcher to throw this ball with the intention of permanently disqualifying me. Ron didn't want to win the title that way and saved my butt. Eventually, Ron became the catcher on my college team and, ultimately, the best man at my wedding to Sam. Let's get back to the present. I could have handled this if Samantha had shown a little respect and simply said, it's over, and I'm leaving. I've been dumped before. True, not since college, and not by a woman who stood in front of a hundred of our friends and relatives and swore to love me forever. But I could have handled it. Trust me. Ever since Sam chose her path, obviously by screwing her colleague Jacob Harris and then coming home to spare me a few seconds, I felt like one of those cartoon characters. My coach whispers in my left ear, take the high road and walk away, while my dad shouts in my right ear, crush them both, son. It didn't take me long or any secret spy tricks to get the solid evidence I needed. 
On Monday morning after the party at her company, I quit my job, hired a divorce attorney, and enlisted a private detective. On the first night of that same week, when Sam called me saying she was working late, I called a former police detective, and he followed them to that jerk's townhouse. There are no photos of them actually having sex, but I'm sure they didn't spend two hours at his townhouse analyzing spreadsheets, everything was ready for Sam's next visit to his home. On Friday evening, she called me to say that she and a couple of women from the office were going to have drinks and dinner. Don't wait up, John. It's been ages since I had a girl's night out. An hour after her call, I drove to the address given to me by the detective and saw Sam's car parked in the driveway. I knocked on the door and was surprised when he opened it, wearing a robe with the same smirk. Don't sweat it, John. I have a black belt in karate. I'm not here to cause trouble, Jacob. She's yours now, and the last thing I need is that deceitful, cheating bitch as a wife. Tell Sam to come to the door so I can deliver these papers. I showed him an envelope of thick paper. Sam, come down the stairs. There's no need to hide. Sam descended the stairs in a robe, just like the jerk. I almost smiled. Sam, here are the divorce papers. Find yourself a lawyer and have them or him contact mine to arrange the settlement. Don't come home tonight or at any other time before tomorrow evening. By then, I'll have packed my things from our apartment, and you can return. Sam took the envelope as if it were radioactive. John, my parents and my brother's family were supposed to come for a late breakfast tomorrow. What should I tell them if I'm not there? No problem, Sam. Just before you came here, I emailed your brother and gave him this address. I told him that you and Jacob will be hosting your family here, not at our apartment. I assume he'll get the message in time. If not, I'll inform them of the change of venue when they come tomorrow. Goodbye. I looked at Sam. She started to tremble and cry, but then I saw it on her left hand, and I almost lost my composure. Sam, you didn't even have the decency to take off my grandmother's wedding ring when you slept with that bastard. Give it to me now. The ring you gave me is in the envelope with the divorce papers. Sam finally broke down but still took the ring off her finger. I left without saying another word that I wasn't entirely surprised when there was a knock on the door at 11 a.m. on Saturday. Perhaps her brother hadn't received my email after all. This is going to be awkward, I thought, peeking out the window and seeing Sam's family on the porch. I had no idea how awkward until I opened the door. John, we're sorry. I received your email and talked to Sam. Can we come in and talk? Over the next hour, her brother, mother, and father did everything they could to convince me that I should let Sam come home and abandon the divorce. It seemed Sam had gone to her brother's home after I left her and Jacob. She confessed everything and asked for their help. Sam knew I loved her parents, especially since my own parents moved to the Sunshine State after my father retired. They talked about counseling, forgiveness, regrets, and so on that I spent the next hour trying to convince them that it wouldn't happen. Nobody was happy, and there were no smiles as they left that IT took all my willpower not to hug my mother-in-law when she stepped onto the porch. She was crying, and I wanted to tell her everything would be okay, but it wasn't, so I refrained from embracing her. Over the next few months, we danced around each other as usual until the divorce became final. She wanted to talk, I didn't. Her lawyer sought advice, mine said it would be a waste of time and money. The marriage was irretrievably broken due to my wife's infidelity. A week before the divorce, Ron invited me over for dinner. He knew more unpleasant details about why Sam and I split than I did because his wife, Jelly, still occasionally communicated with Samantha. I sat in his kitchen watching Jelly prepare dinner. Jelly, as we all called her, was seven months pregnant and positively glowing. Ron saw me looking at her belly and understood what was on my mind. John, let's step out onto the porch and chat. Meet you there, I'm out of beer. I headed to the fridge and, on the way, hugged Jelly around the waist. He adores you, Jelly. Never let him down. 
Why should I bother, John? I love this man, and soon we'll have a little boy. I'm not crazy. That's what I would have said about Samantha a year ago. Look at us now, six days after the divorce. Sam got herself a foolish John. I'm nowhere near as stupid. Ron won't try to talk me out of this, will he? Go there and hear what he has to say. I'll tell you what I tell Sam every time she calls. I'll support both of you in any way I can, except for expressing my opinion to either of you about what you should do. I kissed Jelly on the cheek and stepped outside. I handed Ron one of the beer cans and waited. John, Sam wants to meet with you and talk before the divorce is finalized. She called me and asked me to invite you. That's not surprising. I've thought about it a bit because she's asked before. Why should I give her the satisfaction of her remorse? All it'll do is soothe her, and I'm not going to give her that. I wouldn't either, John. But let me ask you. Do you have any unresolved questions she can answer for you? If so, lay it on her. Get your questions answered first, then do whatever you want. Leave, stay, listen to whatever. What he said made sense. So you didn't call me here to give her another chance? No, John. I only want the best for you. If that means divorce, then I'm with you. I met Sam the evening before our court hearing at a small cafe. We asked for a table in a quiet corner. Thank you for meeting with me, John, Sam said, looking like she was about to burst into tears. It took all my willpower not to think about her little hands that I didn't give her a chance to start the discussion. Sam, I know you have something to say to me, but first, I have a couple of questions. The waiter chose that moment to take our drink orders and start talking about the chef's signature dishes. I interrupted him as politely as I could, ordered a bottle of wine and a chef's salad for two, and asked the waiter to please leave us alone as much as possible. He understood. Sam, my first question is, why? I thought we had something special. We were special, John, but the reasons for my actions, it's all old cliches. We were together and exclusive for seven years. I was tempted by a cute guy at work who complimented me at every opportunity. You spent more and more time thinking about work or being on it. That's unfair, Sam. You know I spent hours just to get that promotion. You wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, and I tried to make that possible. I know that, John. I knew it back then too. But at that time, I was a selfish bitch and wanted it all. Right now, I can't believe how badly I messed up. We had less than a year left before our kids were born. I even had names picked out. Tears streamed from her eyes, and I still resisted, not holding her hands. Okay. I promised myself I wouldn't ask, but I need to know. Was he so much better in bed than me? Sam surprised me. She started laughing through her tears. No, no, no. He wasn't even close to being good in bed. I never had to fake it with you. Sam didn't notice as the waiter approached her from behind when she said this, and when he served the wine, he seized the moment to look at my knees and grinned as he walked away. Sam blushed beet red, and we laughed together for the first time in six months that we finished our salads and wine. Sam spent time trying to get me to accept her apologies, but I wouldn't give in. I told her I might someday, but it was too harsh and too soon that as we got up to leave, Sam dropped one last bomb on me. This is another reason for my actions. John, sometimes you can be as cold as ice. Our marriage will be over tomorrow, and you're like a statue. No tears, no screams. I cry myself to sleep every night. Did you really ever love me? Sam, I loved you more than you can imagine. But first, let's clarify a couple of things. Several times tonight, you mentioned your actions, let's call it what it was, you cheated on me, Sam. You slept with another man when you should have been faithful, betraying everyone else. Secondly, whether I go home tonight and get drunk or cry, that's my business. 
Most likely, after our divorce tomorrow, you and the asshole will become a couple. He has already shown what he thinks of me by sleeping with my wife, ruining my marriage and laughing at me the whole time. If I cry now or tell you about my bad nights, you'll surely tell him someday. Then that arrogant jerk will laugh at my expense again. Don't push me, Sam. You don't want to see the demon lurking beneath the surface, the next day, I didn't go to court. My lawyer took care of it. It was a modern divorce, without fault, with a fair division of assets. That day, the marriage had just fallen apart, months passed after the divorce. I used that time to plan. I did get a promotion at work and a significant raise, but I had no one and nothing to spend it on. I probably spent too much time reading porn stories after Ron told me about it one evening over drinks, Ron told me about the ins and outs of the category, loving wives, and said there were hundreds of stories where the abandoned husband avenges his ex-wife and her lover. I read the stories, took notes, and evaluated my favorite methods of revenge. Ideas that would land me in jail were rated quite low. Psychological terror was rated quite high. The rating changed after one day when I had the misfortune of encountering Jacob.at that time, I didn't know it, but after our divorce, Jacob and Sam started dating again and were now engaged. Jacob made it clear to me that he won, I lost. Sam was fantastic in bed, he couldn't get enough, and apparently there was something wrong with me since he got her into bed so easily when we were married, was I a coward for turning and walking away. I wasn't afraid of Mr. Black Belt but I had just spent two years busting my ass to get this promotion, and any physical altercation would have screwed that half of my life over. This guy already messed up my personal life. Will he find satisfaction in ruining my work life too? I walked away them why method of payback hit me like a thunderbolt out of the blue that it's a funny trait of some guys. They can't resist and dip their pen in the company inkwell. Jacob wasn't an exception. Sam wasn't the first woman from their company he dated. Once, Helen Smith, a woman I met at one of the corporate parties, called me. She wanted to meet me for dinner, her treat, things were getting serious between Jacob and Helen, or so she thought, when he suddenly started treating her like a plague. Jacob dumped Helen when he decided to pursue my wife. The relationship between Jacob and Helen heated up again while Sam was dealing with our divorce but it turned cold immediately after the divorce was finalized, and Jacob and Sam became a couple again, Helen was furious, and there's no fury like a woman scorned. How could you let Jacob steal your wife without even putting up a fight? I was at that holiday party last December and saw how Jacob behaved. I was still in love with Jacob and hoped you would fight for your wife. You did nothing. Are you ignorant or just weak? This dinner invitation was Helen's attempt to toughen me up that I leaned back in the chair, took a sip of my drink, and pondered how to respond to her challenge. Helen, I'm sorry, I don't know you. I don't know how much I can trust you. Right now, trust is limited. But I can tell you I'm not weak, and someday there will be consequences. Have you ever heard the saying, revenge is a dish best served cold? Helen looked at me. Damn, I didn't think. Are you Sicilian? Correct. And if you're truly interested in some revenge, just sit tight, and one day I'll call you and ask for a favor. Nothing illegal, but very important. That evening, I returned home, and my ideas began to clarify. But could I trust Helen to keep her mouth shut? I discreetly checked with someone I could trust, and he confirmed Helen's story. Helen and Jacob were dating, and their breakup coincided with Sam and Jacob's relationship becoming public. As we talked, my source apologized for missing our initial meeting and not warning me beforehand. He kindly informed me that the company's top management was tired of the romantic drama associated with Jacob's affairs, was in the process of rewriting corporate policies regarding workplace romances, and that Jacob, according to rumors, was skating on very thin ice. During my separation and for two months after the divorce, I hired an escort for my sexual and social needs. Cindy Fox, I suppose that was her professional name, and I went out for dinner or shows every two to three weeks and ended up spending a couple of hours having sex in bed before she went home. 
It cost me a pretty penny, but as I mentioned, I had nowhere else to spend my increased salary after the promotion at work. It was my first time paying for sex, at least directly, but I didn't want to tempt myself with rekindling relationships. So Cindy became my go-to whenever I had such desires. She also became an integral part of my plans that I called Helen and told her that if she agreed, she had only two tasks. Firstly, to give me Samantha's schedule for the time when she would be out of town on business. Secondly, to approach Jacob at the right moment and ask him to meet her in a public place to sort things out. The next day, Helen called me. Sam was supposed to leave town for three days and nights in two weeks. Helen had contacted Jacob and arranged to meet him on the first evening of Sam's trip at a bar, just to have a drink and chat, but I'm sure Jacob thought it might be the last time he'd see Helen, Cindy laughed when I explained the first part of my plan, but I truly shocked her when I outlined the second part. Cindy, have any of the women who do what you do ever contracted a social disease? I'm not talking about deadly things like AIDS, I'm talking about curable things like gonorrhea. Of course, it happens, but rarely. Most girls insist on condoms. I know a couple who have sex without a condom, but they try to be careful and charge double for that privilege. There were a couple of girls who had to get treated. Could you do me a favor, please? Let me know when one of the girls has something extra. I'll pay her for sex without the rubber, and I'll pay you the same as for your search. Are you kidding me? You want to give this guy something? Nothing deadly, just something to ruin his wedding night. Everything was set for part one. Cindy told me the details later that evening. She was sitting in the bar, sipping her cocktail, when Jacob walked in and sat down next to her. They exchanged smiles, and Jacob ordered a scotch. Cindy was dressed in a regular business suit and looked very professional, not that professional. Jacob's mobile phone rang almost immediately. Of course, Helen, I understand. I hope your mom gets better. Jacob hung up and immediately turned to Cindy. Hi, I just got dumped because my girlfriend's mom got sick. Can I buy you another? Cindy grinned broadly at Jacob. Sure, I can handle two, but don't try to get me drunk. I've been on the road for two weeks, and in that time, I haven't seen my husband. A girl starts to get lonely. Cindy flashed the engagement ring I bought at a pawn shop for just such an occasion. It was like waving a red cape in front of a bull. Jacob took the bait. My name is Jacob, nice to meet you. Anne. They drank and chatted for about half an hour. Cindy actually had a third glass and tried her best to appear a little tipsy. Before she finished the third, Jacob was trying hard to seduce her. Light touches on her hand and leg, charming conversation with enough sexual innuendo to try to warm her up. Cindy told me it was hard not to laugh at all the effort he was putting into this, considering she was getting paid. Finally, she got tired of the seduction. She finished her cocktail and invited him up to her room, Jacob and Cindy had sex twice in her room. Of course, Jacob didn't know that the whole event was being photographed. Cindy kicked him out, saying she needed to compose herself and get some sleep, but not before getting his mobile number. Then we looked at the photos on my laptop. I promised that any pictures where she could be recognized would be deleted before the camera or memory card left the room. Even after deleting half of the photos, we're left with dozens that show Jacob sleeping with this stranger, the wedding was still a month away, and I hoped we'd be lucky by the end of the month. Two weeks later, Cindy called me with news. One of the girls has gonorrhea. I found out because she asked me and another girl to cover for her while she takes her medication. Did you tell her about my request? In brief. She's willing to talk. But bear in mind she's a professional and will probably charge you double because she thinks it'll be hard for you to find a replacement. What about your rate, is it changing? No, I suppose we made a deal, and you always take good care of me. And it's true, because I always left her extra tips that us owe Cindy and I met with this young lady, she insists on not being named, and worked out the details for the second part. 
It will cost me a few thousand, but it's worth it, Cindy calls Jacob the next day. Hi, Jacob, darling, it's Anne from the hotel, remember me? How could I forget? Are you in town? Yes, I thought, are you ready for the sex of your life? Pretty confident. We had a lot of fun that night, but what are you willing to do to make it the sex of my life? I'm here, at the hotel, with a colleague. She's wild, and after what I told her, she thought you could handle both of us tonight. Can you handle it? Of course, Jacob's self-esteem made him believe that two women would want to him. I just need to make a quick call, and I'll be in the lobby. Not in the lobby. Just come up to room 449. We'll be here. Bring some chilled vodka. When Jacob arrived at room 449, our mysterious girl was there, but Cindy was not. Where's Anne? He asked. And got a call from home. Her son got sick, and she went back to her room, introducing her husband to the schedule. She said he's dealing with a sick child for the first time. But you and I can start, and they did. Cindy never showed up, but our mysterious girl did everything she could to make Jacob forget about the threesome. After he left at 10, she met us at the local cafe and collected the remainder that I owed her. I admit, I felt like shit doing that to the guy, but he's such an asshole that by the time he left, I was almost feeling better. She took the envelope and walked out the door. Cindy looked at me and shrugged. I told you she's a pro. You paid me for the night. Want to go to your place? I wanted to, and we went that I waited a week after the wedding and finished my project. Both Sam and her company received envelopes in the mail with fake return addresses. Each envelope contained a brief letter and a set of photographs the letter to Sam read. Dear Mrs. Harris, I regret to inform you of some bad news, but it seems your husband and my wife were involved while she was in your town. A private investigator hired to gather evidence provided me with these photographs. I included only those showing his face so you have no doubts it's him. I wasn't planning on telling you, except that I just received a message from my doctor that she infected me with a social disease. Perhaps you'll want to get tested, the soon-to-be ex-husband of your husband's whore. The letter to the CEO read, Dear sir, just thought you should know the kind of person working in your company. According to my wife, he picked her up at a bar, got her drunk, and infected her with a social disease. I don't know if this letter will reach you or if you even care, but I'd keep an eye on this scumbag, seems he has no morals. A regretful husband. Everything fell into place quickly. Sam's family ended the marriage, Jacob was fired, and there are rumors they both got treated, it's handy to have a friend in the county health department. I was largely busy getting my life together. Sometimes, I envisioned potential scenarios. In one scenario, I beat the crap out of Jacob. I in another, I pretend to reconcile with Sam, take her to another country, and then leave her there with no credit cards, passport, etc. I could have done the same if not for the vision of her mother and what it would do to her. Maybe I was cruel to my ex-wife, but not to my ex-mother-in-law's daughter, but I quickly lost interest as my new job became more engaging and challenging. This continued until the next Simoncelli family picnic. There was Uncle Vin, my father's older brother. Uncle Vin is connected, if you catch my drift. He beckoned me over, and we had a quiet chat. Johnny, tell me about your divorce, what happened? I like that girl, he said that I recounted to Uncle Vin the Reader's Digest version of our breakup. What did you do about it? He inquired, then I explained what I did to get revenge. That's terrible, but not exactly scorched earth. No, Uncle Vin. I did everything to leave it behind. Chose the high road, I explained to him why. That's good, and those are valid reasons. You know, that baseball coach really did you a solid, Uncle Vin wasn't exactly a big fan when it came to racial issues, but he always found it amusing that a black man from the Chicago projects had as much impact on my life as my father. If you had followed your hot-headed dad, you wouldn't be the man you are today. 
Many times I had to calm down my younger brother, otherwise he'd end up dead or in jail. Have you ever talked to Coach Price? Just a few times and not since I was in my last year of college. I sort of lost touch with him. You should look him up. He volunteers at the Boys and Girls Club in West Palmer. Let him know what he did for you. Men like to hear that from time to time. But right now, go to your dad, give him a hug, and tell him you love him. He needs to hear that too, Uncle Vin was a funny guy. I've heard many people are afraid of him, but around me, he always acted like a teddy bear that I did go see Coach Price, and he convinced me to start volunteering at the club. I even started dating his niece, a beautiful woman, but that's another story, under the romance category. In other words, no drama, just love and one last thing. On my 30th birthday, I received a birthday card from Uncle Vin. It simply said, Happy Birthday, Nephew. Nobody messes with the Simon Kellis. It seems a certain Jacob Harris was found last night in an alley behind the bar he frequents. He was a victim of a robbery. Nothing life-threatening, but he had a broken nose, several fingers and ribs, and two severely swollen testicles. I guess his black belt must have stayed home that night. Thank you for making our channel a part of your story. Keep unraveling the knots of love with us and immersing yourself in the world of unique emotions. See you soon on Tangled Hearts.